Right. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here so uh, numerously, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, as uh, he said, uh, I'm Tobias Hoinka. I have been working for EMBW for like 1.5 years, roughly, uh, and worked there on predictive uh, modeling and anomaly detection and basically uh, something that's called condition monitoring. I'm going to try to explain to you in this talk uh, what kind of problems we face and how we're uh, planning on solving and how we're solving them currently, and uh, all the challenges that are ahead and so forth. So this is a table of contents first, a little bit. Uh, at first, I will talk about condition monitoring at EMBW. So I will talk about an application called EMBW Asset Radar, which is like a proprietary uh, software that EMBW uh, develops in-house. Uh, I will talk about data sources, so what kind of data do we have available about our wind turbines to monitor them. I'm going to talk about anomaly detection first, like in a more general sense. I will define what that actually is, and you know, maybe you'll see that it's actually kind of difficult, or more difficult than you would assume. I'm going to talk about predictive modeling, then what's, what's the idea behind that, how do you do that, what, you know, what kind of challenges are there. And then I'm going to talk about that topic specifically, and uh, how we use that at EMBW, how we do it, and then about future plans, uh, a concept uh, we coined as anomaly space and how we use that. And then a hopefully very helpful example to understand what we're doing and why we're doing exactly that. All right, so let's get started. So first of all, uh, I want to talk about Asset Radar. So Asset Radar is, a, as I said, like a proprietary uh, application. And um, it's, uh, the way it works currently is it monitors roughly 450 wind turbines that are located in Germany or some other parts of Europe, uh, mostly Sweden, I think. And the idea there is that it monitors all relevant components. Uh, that means uh, not every single one of them, but only those that are judged to be important for maintenance. Uh, we use multiple detection methods, so it's not really like just like one thing we do, but we actually have like a, a, a set of, of um, either established or uh, customized methods we use to uh, keep track of our uh, units. And all that is, as I said already, in bundled in proprietary, proprietary software. And uh, it basically collects data, like in this little graphic on the bottom there. Uh, you see uh, the parks collect data, send that to a park server, and the park server then sends that to the cloud. And uh, everything that's in that little uh, bluish, I suppose, cloud, that is pretty much what Asset Radar does. And Asset Radar then sends alerts to diagnosticians. And those are actually humans, right? So these are. Uh, uh, real engineers that uh, know wind turbine energy and actually look at the data and confirm whether what is spotted by asset radar is in fact a, uh, a real concern or not at all. And then it, they will decide then how to proceed with that. Like usually uh, they would indicate stuff like on-site uh, follow-ups or stuff like that. All right, the uh, objectives uh, overall for, of asset radar are to uh, minimize uh, on-site maintenance that's really important. So we want to go there as little as possible and as early as possible because the rule of thumb is the earlier you repair something, the cheaper it is. So, uh, and you really want to have those cheap ones because basically if you wait too long, uh, the worst case is you have to basically replace the whole thing. And you don't want to do that except for the tower. That's usually not something that breaks very easily. Um, yeah, and we want to monitor all units uh, operated by EMBW. That includes actually solar uh, power plants and water power plants and so forth. Um, we want to use all data uh, that is available to us, so we don't want to skip on anything or, or uh, miss any, any defects. And uh, the, the main goal is continuous development and improvement. So we don't want to be stuck on like one state and just ship that forever, but we want to keep going and use the knowledge we gather from the diagnosticians and uh, put that into the uh, application. Right, so that is about that. Now I'm going to talk about data sources. And uh, one and the most important data sources I'm going to talk about here, that's called SCADA. It's uh, short for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, something I only learn when I talk about it in talks. But yeah, we usually call it SCADA. And what SCADA is, it uh, continuously collects data from multiple sensors, like you know, temperatures, pressures, currents, all kinds of physical quantities and then aggregates that in 10-minute intervals. So we don't really look at the raw data, which could have any sampling rate. I don't even know, actually, what the raw sampling rate is, because we only look at SCADA data. Uh, and these 10-minute intervals, they are summarized in like you know, the mean, the min, the max, and the standard deviation. And that's 
pretty much all we work with. Um, and that's an example, I guess, of what it looks like. So those are just two really random uh, signals. Uh, the top is like a bearing temperature, and the, top, uh, and the bottom is like a wind speed that is uh, measured by something we call anemometer, uh, which is like an instrument to uh, measure wind speed. So as in the shaded area is like everything between min and max, and uh, the straight line is then the mean. Usually we have a standard deviation too. I didn't put this in here, so you can see anything at all. So yeah, so that's the data we're working with on the SCADA side. Then we have oscillation data. That's a, a tad more complicated. So that's bas basically acceleration data collected uh, in, in strategic locations in the machine. Uh, really, the way you can think about this is imagine like tiny little microphones that measure what kind of noise the machine is making. And those are not continuously measuring because you, know, you need very high sampling rates for this, like, you're, like up to 50 kilohertz or something like that. You can't really afford that uh, on these tiny computers there on the machine, so you do that irregularly. You just kind of like uh, trigger a measurement when it's um, useful, and then you have a few seconds of like an audio clip of what the unit sounds like. It's kind of like when you sit in a car and something's wrong with the car, and you can kind of hear like where it comes from. That's basically what this is. And that allows for a very specific analysis of the faults. Because basically, the way uh, it works is you have the drivetrain. So the drivetrain, I have to explain maybe, is everything that rotates in the wind turbine. That's part of the drivetrain. So the rotor blades in the, in the front, and then the generator in the back, and then the gear in the middle. And you have a lot of translations of these uh, rotations into different frequencies. So whenever you see, uh, maybe I could just go to the next one. Um, and whenever you see like a frequency that peaks, you know which part of the turbine is creating that peak. So when you see a growing peak over time, you usually know, like, OK, something in the turbine that is rotating with that frequency is having some trouble there. right? So here, maybe for some more explanation, top is the raw data, so really like an audio clip. You could actually listen to that. You can actually listen to that in Asset Raider, I think. Um, and the bottom is just a spectrum, like a, an FFT, if that says anything to you. Uh, so really straightforward uh, processing there to analyze the frequencies. All right, so now I'm going to talk about anomaly detection and why it's such a hard problem. Um, so I, I try to like, explain this with as little formulae as possible. Let's see how I fare. Um, so basically, uh, when you would ask yourself, like, what would I consider an anomaly, you would probably say something like, oh, yeah, well, an anomaly is something that's not normal, and uh, you will probably catch yourself uh, as using that word in the vaguest of terms because it's actually very hard to define what is normal. Uh, and usually, all kinds of things go into a definition of normal. Like it's not just uh, you know something very objective, but it's actually something like the business case uh, is interwoven into your definition of normal. And in the case of a wind turbine, what do you want the wind turbine to do, right? The, you want it to produce electricity, and you better hope that is as much electricity as can be produced, right? So that is your concept of normal, but it's still, it's not that simple, really, because it's a very technical term, and a lot of complexity is involved in there. So that's why I said it's very much non-trivial. Statistically, maybe you would define something like, um, a density or something like that. So here on the right, you see, like, I called this some feature. It's just some toy example of data. And you can plot a histogram of that or something like that. And then you can maybe fit, like, a PDF to that model. That's the orange line, right? And you would say uh, an anomaly is an observation you made in a region where that uh, orange line is very small, basically. So everything above 1.5 or below minus 1.5, you would maybe consider an anomaly in this case, or an outlier, depending of, on how you phrase that. Right, so in this univariate case, this seems to be uh, very easy, even though uh, calculating a density uh, from data alone is notoriously difficult, as uh, some of you might know. So, and it gets more complicated when you look at multivariate data, right? Like, so here I extended the data from before by another dimension, and you can see uh, here this orange star in the middle uh, you would maybe consider completely normal in the univariate marginal distributions, or these projections, really. Uh, but in the joint view of both features at the same time, this is actually like kind of obviously a really odd one uh, there in the middle of this uh, strange curve there. So, and of course, this problem gets uh, harder and harder the higher the dimensionality of your data. 
And uh, another problem that was actually kind of obvious with the univariate case too is uh, the decision has to be made, like when is P so small that you will actually uh, frame this as an, an anomaly, right? Like that is actually kind of a very subjective uh, decision and it's kind of tied to the question like how often do we expect uh, anomalies to occur? And also a follow-up problem of this is if you can never really objectively decide whether something is an anomaly or not, how do you find like a, you know, a, a data set that is actually completely normal that you can train any algorithms on, right? And um, the time series, we have time series in, in this case, and time series are actually especially difficult because really every data point kind of depends on all previous data points. And you can actually f easily find uh, um, samples that look completely fine in the, when you look at them in an isolated way, but the way it evolved over time is completely off. Right, so uh, one way out of this, or like one treatment of this, I suppose, is predictive modeling. And I'm gonna present to you like the idea behind it in the context of wind turbines. So really the expectation is that if you have a healthy system, then pretty much there should be very stable and, and robust uh, relationship between uh, certain signals or certain data that is provided by that system, right? In the case here of the wind turbine that you see here on the right, uh, what does the wind turbine see? It mostly sees like wind speed and direction, it sees like air temperature and air pressure and so forth, and it really just reacts to these environmental features. It, it kind of works autonomously for the most part, and then you should actually be able to predict all other signals from this, right? This would be like the wishful thinking or whatever. And uh, so what, there's really no reason why you couldn't replace that wind turbine by a statistical model. So why don't we just do that? Try to predict every other signal. And if we get significantly worse than usual or than in the training set, then we know something's off, right? And those deviations from uh, the usual predictive performance, we could basically just label. Uh, a defect, right? That would be basically the idea. So the, the, the way we use this at EMBW is uh, fairly simple. So this is an example for like three input signals and one target signal. In gray, the shade area is the training period. And the training period is mostly determined by those diagnosticians I mentioned earlier. They would look at the data, they will see like, okay, this uh, first year of operation, by, by the, for example, looks fairly innocuous, let's use it and uh, maybe we'll cut out like a few uh, weird looking uh, bits of it or whatever, and then we'll have our training period. It's very important that a training period, by the way, is one full year of data because it turns out that seasons are a thing and you kind of want to account for that. Um, so this training period then we split up in a train and test set uh, like this maybe. We usually use a one to six ratio, which uh, makes no difference, but that's what we do. And on the train set, then with the train set, we uh, train a regression model. We, uh, for the most part, use uh, just GBRTs and train a regression model on that and then evaluate that on the test set. And from the test set, we then get like a set of model deviations that the model has never seen, right? On, on, on samples that the model has never seen. And that uh, test set of model deviations we can really use to gauge our, um, our system and to uh, answer the question like how, uh, when is a model deviation unusual enough to uh, give an alert or whatever, right? So this is basically then the result. We have model deviations on the test set. Those can, you know, theoretically have any shape. They can be skewed or long tails or whatever. Um, and then we want to decide like what is unusual. The way we do this right now is we just do a make a statistical modeling of this of some kind. Uh, that's the orange curve here. And then we basically set like a lower threshold for this and an upper threshold for this that can't be crossed uh, based on really pretty much like a quantile that is indicated by the statistical model. All right, so that's what we do with that. Okay, then uh, one well, a problem really to, to, to solve is uh, this trade-off here between specific and uh, generic. So what this really means is we could theoretically uh, choose a model that is super generic. We just dump everything into the model and try to estimate from that dump of inputs everything that comes out. You could, for example, think of an autoencoder of some, some, some type, right? 
that would give you the advantage of very few models, in this case, maybe even just one. And you have very complete monitoring because you can just dump everything in and you're done, basically. But the problem here is um, it's extremely hard to interpret these models, for the most part because of, uh, you know, you, you, you may think something like, well, every, um, every signal that I didn't reconstruct re probably is the signal I want to look at. But usually you have like, issues with like, cause and effect in these models, and it's not that easy actually to do so. Um, also, another downside is we actually have engineers on board at EMBW. They know their machines very well, and we did not, did not use that knowledge at all. Right? So we basically look at everything, not at the things that the engineers are interested in. So and then the trade-off on the other end is uh, specific models with few inputs. So that, of course, gives you then a lot of models. In our case, uh, it is a lot of models, like 20,000 or something like that. Um, so that's, that's, of course, a, 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 a sort of a maintenance problem as well. Um, and of course, not every signal that the machine records is necessarily monitored, right? Like, so it's only the things are monitored that the engineers decide to look at. And the hope is, of course, that the engineers know their machines well enough to know that we won't miss anything. Uh, on the upside, though, each model indicates like a very small subset of diagnoses. So we don't just uh, you know, know oh, something's off vaguely, like in the case of the uh, autoencoder, but we actually kind of know like, which relationship is violated in, that, uh, in, in the machine, and we can actually make very specific uh, follow-ups and look at these things uh, in this very specific way, uh, which is, of course, not perfect. You still have like, you know, a, a number of input signals, and you never know, like, okay, who is the culprit here? You have, always have to check, and you always have to check maybe with other models, too, and so forth. So there's still like, some manual um, work to do, but at, at least not as much as with the uh, autoencoder. And of course, yeah, well, the engineering knowledge is now there. I think that's kind of obvious. All right, so then uh, on this kind of empty slide, uh, you see um, our future plan of automatic diagnoses. So really the problem we have, we're facing right now is uh, we have a lot of units right now. We have very few diagnosticians. And in the future, we assume that there will probably, probably be more units to come, right? Like way more, we all hope, I suppose. Um, and so we kind of need to have like some, some sense of scalability. We want to know like how much can we scale this without basically linearly scaling the number of diagnosticians at work. So uh, what we really need there is we need the models to give us, or we need a model really, to give us more precise pointers on what to look at uh, to facilitate um, the process of uh, getting to a diagnosis. And the idea here is basically what we want to develop is like some type of meta model that uh, learns from previous defects, puts things together and kind of like uh, you know, mix and match uh, certain uh, previous uh, defects with new ones. So, but there's of course like uh, a, a huge number of challenges <laughs> with this involved. Like, so this cluster of words here is supposed to give you like a sense of just how diverse the data really is we're, we're working with. So it's not like we all have like one type of wind turbine that we put everywhere and then that's the end of it and they don't they, they're not all equipped with the same kind of sensors, and they don't have all the same uh, type of uh, specifications. In fact, like even stuff like components here, right? Like there are wind turbines that don't even have gears. So <laughs> a gear fail failure on a gearless wind turbine is probably not a very likely diagnosis, I suppose. Um, so and like that, we have all kinds of other things. Like uh, let me mention like weather and seasons. That's also a really complicated one. If we, for example, see a defect and it was used to be like kind of stormy or there were like a few wind gusts there, uh, kind of unusual maybe for the season or something like that, then whatever meta model you train on that, that probably will point out that every gusty season is a defect and you don't want that. So that's kind of difficult to account for too. Like, you know, in, in the best case, we actually would displace defect wind turbines with all kinds of uh, defects all over Germany and just let it run for a year and then we had enough data. But that's not possible, or at least it's not very economical. So uh, we kind of have to find a way to kind of ignore everything that's irre irrelevant. So that's a very tough problem to solve. Uh, the next challenge is labels. So, um, well, we have diagnosticians and they do their job, of course, uh, but we still have uh, kind of incomplete labels because uh, not the whole lifetime of every unit we have is uh, fully monitored in the same way. So we're missing some, um, 
we're missing some labels here and there and so forth. And um, also defects are really rare, right? Like uh, as a data scientist, I can say it's unfortunate as everyone else, like normal people, they would probably say that's actually really good, right? But uh, so we're missing labels. Uh, I pointed out a few like rough uh, units here. Uh, 450 units we have, uh, seven years of average lifetime, and roughly 80 monitored signals per unit on average. Actually, it's more, but 80 is just the number of signals we monitor. So that would combine into like 252,000 years of data. Uh, with a 10-minute resolution, that's like a few billion samples, really. And that's, of course, a lot. And you would think like, oh, yeah, that's a lot. So just train a huge neural network on it or something. But uh, that's actually not really possible because of the heterogeneity problem. Right? So and f of that data, it's uh, only 0.05%, which is actually in any way labeled to have a defect or some kind of, um, I don't know, unusual behavior. So that's very, very little, because you can barely see that red little bar there. Right? So that's another huge problem. We just don't have the labels, really, to train anything more sophisticated. And uh, that's also kind of a problem. So our solutions to this problem, or our solution to the problem right now is uh, the anomaly space. It's something we coined. I don't know where it exactly comes from. But the idea is basically um, we don't actually look at uh, our uh, units in the sense of their absolute uh, measurements, like, oh, the bearing temperature was 50 degrees or something like that. Like, nothing absolute and specific like this, but rather we just look at every component of our unit in the context of the unit. Like, the question isn't, like, uh, what is the bearing temperature, but the question is, uh, how unusual is that bearing temperature given the current conditions? And we basically collect all kinds of anomaly detectors like that that o always give us, like, a normalized view of how unusual something is, and we work with that, right? And the reason why we need to do this, again, like I talked about heterogeneity, but there's also the problem of like uh, slight differences in, in, in how the sensors are installed, even in units of the same type. So it's kind of difficult to work with that. And from that, we hope to uh, extract a, a signature uh, of every defect, and from that we hope that we can actually recognize defects from earlier. And um, then the question is, of course, like, why do we need so many uh, detectors? Like, because you can see here, like this on the right here, is like a collection of heat maps for every single detector we have available for, like, I think, one unit. Uh, and that's just like a little crop of the uh, actual full uh, list. So why do we need so many? And uh, I have an example here that's hopefully kind of helpful to understand, like, also what the diagnosticians are really doing. So. Here uh, is an example of a power output model. So what that does is it takes like the wind speed and the temperature and like the position of the wind turbine relative to the wind and so forth, and tries to estimate from that what is the expected power output of that unit. Right? It's fair, fairly simple, I think. And we see here in this region it has actually very unusual uh, deviations from the norm. Right? Like before that, before this shaded area, it looks way different from. What it looks like inside. So you'd think like, oh, something's wrong with the power output of the unit. Uh, sounds really complicated. And then you look, maybe you check first. Okay, how does this power output actually compare with the neighboring units, right? Because they all see that like roughly the same wind. So you'd expect like on average they would kind of like cancel out to like have no difference at all. And as you can see here, that's actually the case here. So there's actually nothing wrong with the power output of that unit because it has the same power output as the rest of it. So that's kind of uh, disheartening. And then you would probably uh, go on and look at this here, which is uh, a model we created. So think about uh, the wind turbine as a giant wind speedometer, or an anemometer, we call that usually. So it just measures the wind speed in a very robust way. And uh, then additionally to that, we usually have two mechanical anemometers. This is such a difficult word to say, by the way. Uh, we have two anemometers installed on the unit that redundantly measure the wind speed. So we have three uh, things that measure the same thing, so we can kind of like tell whether one is odd. And in this case, and uh, it's kind of like shown in the bottom of the two plots, uh, sensor one, two of the two sensors is actually defective. And so you know what at first maybe looked like a you know problem with like a complex problem with the operation of the unit actually turns out just to be a defective anemometer because, uh, you know, some bird takes revenge or something like that. 
Um, <laughs> you laugh, but it's actually something that happens. So. Um, all right. So, uh, and that, I think, concludes my talk already. So uh, here's some summary. You can read it, I guess. And uh, let's uh, move on to the Q&A, I suppose. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
but we really look for robust trends. We look for like actually like paradigm shifts in the way the unit operates, not really for like you know statistical fluctuations in any sense. Then I would like to thank you for a very very interesting talk. Maybe we can have an yeah.